Hello, I am Pieter Jan Lovenius, a PhD student at Ghent University in the research unit Vegetech. In this tutorial, I will explain the importance of microbial air quality during food packaging and how aseptic packaging can be a solution to handle this often overlooked contamination route. Four main parts will be covered. First, we will start with an introduction to how food can get contaminated through the air. Next, we will discuss methods for controlling air quality, including a few practical examples. Subsequently, we will zoom in on the Belgian case study from the European Fair Chain project, which focused on developing a small-scale aseptic packaging machine. Finally, we will end this tutorial with some take-home messages. In this introduction, a brief overview of the research unit Vegetech will be provided, followed by an in-depth discussion on food contamination via the air, including a definition of bioaerosols. The research unit Vegetech is located at the campus Kortrijk of Ghent University. Vegetech focuses on research and development in vegetable and potato technology, aiming to bridge the gap between laboratory-scale research and industrial-scale applications. Their work involves innovation in processing technologies, food quality and safety, and sustainability within the food industry. Vegetech collaborates with industry partners and participates in various research pro projects to advance knowledge and practices in vegetable processing and related areas. Now focusing on airborne contamination. In the 18th century, when little was known about the life of microorganisms, Louis Pasteur discovered that microorganisms in wine and beer did not spontaneously generate, but were introduced from the environment. He found that these airborne microorganisms could also contaminate sterile solutions. These microorganisms are rarely free-floating. Instead, they typically attach to inert solid particles or hitchhike on animal-derived particles or water droplets. These airborne particles containing microorganisms are also known as bioaerosols. In a food facility, microorganisms mainly contaminate food via surface contact, personnel or airborne transmission. The contribution of the first two routes is dominant. However, the importance of each contamination route varies depending on the specific product or process. Surface contamination happens when microorganisms transfer from contaminated equipment or packaging materials to food products, typically resulting from inadequate cleaning and disinfection practices. Contamination through personnel occurs when people practice improper hygiene, such as inadequate hand washing or the absence of hygienic clothing such as hair nets. While these two routes pose serious risks to food safety and quality, this tutorial will focus on an often neglected contamination route, the air. The risk of airborne contamination involves more than just the number of microorganisms in the air. To understand its complexity, we need to consider several factors. First, we must examine the sources of microorganisms, which can arise from external sources, such as outside air bringing in dust and pollutants, and internal sources, such as activities within the production or packaging hall. The composition of external air varies depending on the location, whether in a city or countryside and is also influenced by weather conditions such as rain or sunshine. Contamination generated internally also occurs and is influenced by many factors. For instance, personal or major source of spreading internal airborne microorganisms. The number of particles released depend on the person's activity level. For example, walking releases 10 times more particles than sitting. And additionally, factors such as the type of clothing they wear and whether they are sneezing or coughing also influence the number of particles dispersed into the environment. In addition to personal, other sources of internal airborne microorganisms include raw materials and operational activities like moving equipment, and cleaning practices such as high-pressure hosing, which can unintentionally contribute to the spread of airborne microorganisms. And lastly, ventilation systems. These systems are essential for maintaining good air quality, but can also become breeding grounds for microorganisms that may contaminate the factory environment. 
Moreover, air circulation also contributes to the spread of contaminants from other sources. So now that we know the potential sources of airborne contamination in a food facility, determining whether these particles will settle on surfaces or remain airborne adds complexity. Several factors influence particle deposition on food surfaces. For instance, the duration microorganisms remain airborne depends on the size, the shape and the weight of the carrier particles, such as dust and mist. In the figure, these particles are shown in blue. Larger particles will settle more quickly due to gravity, whether smaller ones can linger longer in the air. And to give you an idea of the scale, the size of the microorganisms are shown in orange. And on top of that, research highlights the role of airflow conditions on particle deposition. Airflow patterns significantly affect particle movement along surfaces. For instance, turbulent airflow can enhance the likelihood of particle deposition, which is, which is shown in red in the figure. In contrast, well-regulated ventilation systems with consistent air velocity can mitigate particle deposition. However, caution is needed, as studies indicate that simply increasing ventilation rates and airflow does not always result in the proportional decrease in particle concentration. Another factor that influences airborne food contamination is the time food is exposed to the air, and this along with the surface area of the food, with longer exposure times and larger surface areas increasing the risk of contamination. Lastly, the characteristics of the food product matter. For instance, moist or sticky foods, such as sauces, are more, are more likely to attract and retain particles compared to dry food, such as pasta. Therefore, moist or sticky foods have a higher risk level. It is important to note that this factor focuses on the physical characteristics of the food product and not on its sensitivity to microbial growth. All these factors influence the level of airborne contamination in the final product. Food products with minimal airborne contamination during packaging fall into the green zone, while those with higher contamination levels are placed in the red zone. For example, in guacamole, which is a smaller surface area and shorter exposure time during packaging, typically accumulates fewer bioaerosols compared to frozen pizza which has a larger surface area and a longer exposure time. Other influencing factors described earlier also affect the food product's placement on the x-axis, although they are not considered in the simplified explanation of spoilage and, and safety risk. Furthermore, the significance of air as a source of microbial contamination varies depending on the intrinsic or extrinsic factors of a food product. Intrinsic factors are characteristics of the food itself, such as pH and nutrient content, while extrinsic factors refer to the environment surrounding the food, such as storage temperature. Critical products, like guacamole, exhibit a higher sensitivity to microbial growth, thereby posing a greater risk of contamination during their shelf lives compared to the non-critical products, such as frozen pizza. Frozen pizza typically contains higher level of salt and preservatives and is stored in a frozen state, which helps mitigate microbial growth. Guacamole is used as an example due to its sensitivity, characterized by high moisture content, a neutral pH and fewer preservatives, which collectively create an ideal environment for microbial growth. This relationship is represented as an upward trend on the graph where higher class signifies increased risk of potential microbial growth during its shelf life. If you want to explore this topic further, I recommend this freely accessible scientific article recently published in the International Journal of Food Microbiology. Now let's examine how airborne contamination can be controlled with a focus on food regulations, standards and guidelines that prioritize preventive measures. Two effective strategies include zoning and the installation of HVAC, or heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems. Zoning involves creating specific areas within the production facility, each with its classification of hygiene and cleanliness requirements, basic, medium and high. 
while the food product follows the direction of the process, the air strictly flows from the high to the basic hygiene zones. By controlling access, respecting hygiene practices and implementing HVAC systems in these zones, the risk of cross-contamination between different areas is significantly reduced. Depending on the zone, the HVAC system includes a certain number of filters. Pocket filters act as a pre-filter to remove larger particles such as dust from the supply and recirculated air. Cassette filters are optimal for dealing with particulate matter and microorganisms thanks to their high dust holding capacity. HEPA filters remove over 99.995% of the remaining particles, including germs and viruses from the air. According to the AH guidelines, it is a recommendation to install at least a two-stage filter system in production areas with a medium hygiene risk, and a three-stage filter system in areas with a high hygiene risk, such as packaging areas. For more information on assessing the efficiency of air filters in removing particulate matter from the air, check out ISO 16890. This standard classifies filters based on their ability to capture particles of various sizes. While this standard is essential for understanding and improving air quality, it is important to know that it mainly focuses on particle filtration and is not specifically designed for filtering microorganisms. Assessing air quality is essential for understanding the potential risk of airborne contamination. This assessment involves extracting a representative sample of airborne microorganisms from the area of interest. This can be achieved through either passive or active sampling methods. Passive sampling involves exposure of a petri dish with a specific growth media to the air. While this method allows us to determine the velocity at which microorganisms settle on the surface of a food product, it also has several disadvantages. These include bias towards larger particles due to gravity, sensitivity to air movement, and an unknown sample volume that is extracted. The standard EN17141 describes passive sampling but lacks a specific interpretation of quantitative results to assess airborne contamination in specific, specific production context for different food products. Active sampling quantifies the number of airborne microorganisms by determining the sample volume and sampling rate beforehand. Various devices are available for this purpose. In this tutorial, we will focus on one specific device an impactor that actively pumps air into a petri dish with a specific growth media. For more information on suitable devices, please check out the recent EN17141. Both passive and active methods faces the same issue. Current standards and guidelines lack clear interpretation of quantitative results. This means there is no detailed explanation of what a certain concentration of airborne microorganisms whether in the air or settled, implies for the contamination of a food product. In absence of clear interpretation of quantitative results, scientific research has proposed various microbial airborne limits. For example, in the dairy industry, a total microbial count of up to about 300 CFU per cubic meter is considered acceptable. But there is a lack of consistency in these guidelines. To illustrate the issue with inconsistent guidelines in literature, consider a practical example from a large-scale dairy factory. Normally during the day, microbial counts are very low, falling within the green area of acceptable levels. However, when drains are cleaned, microbial counts can spike up to 300 CFU per cubic meter. One research team may classify this as a moderately acceptable, as you can see in the figure as the orange area while another team might still consider it within the green area. This inconsistency highlights the uncertainty in determining acceptable levels. And then for the meat industry, researchers mention a maximum limit of 500 CFU per cubic meter. And while every sector required its own limits, depending on the production process and product type, these limits are often used across different sectors.
This lack of standardized sampling methodologies and result interpretation makes it challenging to compare quantitative data from previous research. There is a clear need for a tailored approach that considered both the production context and the specific type of product. To start this tailored approach, an air sampling assessment was recently conducted using a consistent methodology specifying the production context and type of food product. The following section briefly outlines the key findings from this evaluation. Our study revealed a correlation between settled microorganisms, the passive method, and airborne microorganisms, the active method. For simplicity, the results from the active measurements are presented. The findings reveal that the concentration of airborne microorganisms varied widely among the packaging areas of companies filling semi-liquid food products. For instance, in a large-scale production facility of dairy products, with robust preventive measure measures such as effective zoning and advanced HVAC systems, the air sampling results showed low levels of microorganisms. In contrast, a small-scale producer without such preventive measures exhibited microbial counts that were 100 times higher. So without effective zoning and HVAC systems, airborne microorganisms have more potential to contaminate the product during packaging. In summary, this example illustrates that effective preventive measures help maintain high microbial air quality with large-scale producers showcasing the best results, while small-scale producers exhibit a higher contamination risk. However, it is important to know that even in high standard companies, where strict hygiene rules are implemented, airborne microorganisms are present and can potentially contaminate produced and packaged food products. The publication further highlights some misunderstood indicators for controlling airborne microbial counts. In fact, we discovered that microbial air quality was unaffected by seasonal effects, nor by location of the food factory. As shown here, while bacteria and yeast and molds in the outdoor air vary among the sampled companies, there is no corresponding trend in the indoor air quality around the filling machines. This suggests that external air quality does not impact indoor air quality in the packaging areas. This is likely because most factories in this study have implemented preventive measures to prevent external air from entering the packaging hall. Moreover, factors related to air quality such as indoor relative humidity and indoor temperature showed no correlation with the number of airborne microorganisms around the sampling filling areas. This means that controlling temperature and humidity does not impact the concentration of microorganisms in the air. However, it is still important to control temperature and humidity to maintain overall hygiene in the food facility. Considering the filter clause of the HVAC system installed in the packaging hull, which is meant to control air quality, we observed some remarkable findings. The clause of filter installed in the HVAC system showed no correlation with the number of particles in the air. Moreover, there seemed to be no correlation between the number of microorganisms in the air and total particle count. The left graph illustrates the reduction in bacterial and yeast and mold counts across different filter classes. The right graph shows the reduction in particle counts with a diameter below 2.5 micrometer across different filter classes. HVAC systems were highly effective in reducing levels of microorganisms including bacteria, yeast and molds. Therefore, these systems significantly improved the indoor microbial air quality. However, these systems had a smaller effect on total particle counts. Filters designed to retain 65% of particles smaller than 2.5 micrometer and higher class filters that retain 80% of particles smaller than 1 micrometer showed moderate reductions in total particle counts. The most significant improvements in both microbiological and particle reduction were observed with HEPA filters. One major issue is that current standards on air quality are not harmonized across different industries, leading to inconsistencies. Additionally, these standards lack specific microbial requirements, 
creating gaps in ensuring air quality. This highlights the need for more targeted microbial guidelines in food processing environments to ensure comprehensive air quality management. We can conclude that unlike well-equipped large industries, smaller producers like farmers have more difficulties in maintaining clean air quality around their food products during packaging. In the Belgian case study of the Fairchain project, we specifically wanted to address this problem by developing an aseptic packaging machine that could be placed inside the farm or small producer. Especially for small-scale producers, aseptic packaging represents a significant opportunity. Many small-scale producers lack advanced air handling systems, which have shown to be critical for maintaining clean air quality during packaging. And also, in Belgium, small-scale producers may follow less stringent hygiene rules due to relaxations, such, such as applying a sector-based self-checking guide instead of a company-tailored food safety management system. However, this may result in higher risk of cross-contamination, which must be taken into account in determining the shelf lives. This and the availability and seasonable variability of raw materials may lead to other challenges, such as limited access to larger markets, which results in competitive pressure from larger established companies. Considering these challenges, an aseptic packaging machine can help small producers improve their market reach and product quality. This method allows them to operate in non-sterile environments and still ensure high quality, safe products with longer shelf life, opening up possibilities for expanding their businesses beyond local markets. Before we proceed to aseptic packaging, we first go over the conventional method. During such a process, the product is packaged and sealed before undergoing heat treatment, like sterilization or pasteurization. This extends shelf life, but requires both the product and packaging to endure the heat without compromising the quality. With aseptic packaging, on the other hand, the product and packaging are separately sterilized beforehand. Sterilization of the product is usually done via heat treatment, while hydroxyl peroxide or UV light may be used to sterilize the packaging material. Next, the sterile product is filled into sterile packages in a controlled environment to maintain sterility. And lastly, the packages are sealed in a sterile environment to prevent any contamination ensuring the product remains safe and has a long shelf life. In summary, with aseptic packaging, the sterility of both the product and the packaging is maintained through the entire packaging process. So why switch to aseptic packaging? Aseptic packaging offers several compelling advantages. It can support sustainability by significantly reducing waste, and this makes it not only cost-effective, but also environmental friendly, aligning with modern consumer and industry demands for sustainable practices. Aseptic packaging also allows small-scale producers to operate in non-sterile environments effectively. Moreover, this method not only extends shelf life considerably compared to traditional methods, it also maintains product quality in terms of flavor, color and nutritional value. This ensures that consumers receive products that are not only safe and have longer shelf lives, but also retain their sensory attributes and possible health benefits. Furthermore, aseptic packaging facilitates market expansion beyond local areas, enabling small producers to reach broader consumer markets. However, key disadvantages to consider include the complexity of the machinery which requires specialized knowledge to operate. There is also a high initial investment cost, which can be mitigated through sharing or leasing the equipment. Technical expertise is essential, necessitating skilled personnel and additional training. While heat treatment is not a concern for packaging materials, compatibility with disinfectants, especially chemicals, requires more research. And lastly, consumer perception can be a disadvantage, as some consumers may prefer traditional packaging methods due to concerns of freshness, taste and familiarity.
Now to summarize what has been discussed in this tutorial. Our key experimental findings indicate significant variation in airborne microbial concentrations across different food companies, particularly in packaging zones of semi-liquid food producers. Interestingly, common environmental factors like outdoor air quality, temperature, relative humidity, and indoor total, total particle count were not correlated with airborne microbial counts. Instead, preventive measures like zoning and air filtration were effective in controlling microorganisms, though they had less impact on overall particle counts. However, a major issue persists. We still don't fully understand the extent of airborne contamination in the food industry, due to inconsistent air sampling methods and inadequate quantitative data on factors like particle deposition. Additionally, the production context and specific product characteristics are overlooked. And to tackle this problem, numeric guidelines must be tailored to integrate risk assessment models, providing accurate and useful data for maintaining food safety and quality. Although the extent of airborne contamination should be researched across different production contexts, aseptic packaging presents a promising solution. It ensures product safety and quality even in less controlled environments by improving air quality at critical stages of production. This can be particularly beneficial for small-scale producers, allowing them to uphold high standards and compete more effectively on a larger scale. And as you have discovered during this tutorial, continuous improvement in air quality management is essential. Therefore, staying updated with evolving standards and guidelines for best practices is necessary. So please visit our website for more information and future research on this topic. We look forward to continuing the discussion and collaboration among the industry, researchers and regulators. Thank you for your attention and participation.